I'm so happy to welcome Senator Mike Braun. Thanks for joining me. Hey, my pleasure to be on. So, Senator, let's get down to business, which you know a lot about, and the business of business. You're on record saying federal stimulus payments and bigger unemployment checks are essentially counterproductive for the economy. Tell us why. So it is clearly competition with the productive economy. I spent last week, the recess week, traveling our state. Uh, it was a uniform chorus, small, medium, large businesses, federal government, you're keeping us from getting our own employees back to work. Uh, it's rational on a part of many of the employees when you've got a 40 hour work week at $15 an hour, 600 bucks, even in a low cost of living state like Indiana, you're getting more than that paid to be on the sidelines. So I was loving it when governors across the country were saying enough is enough. I've challenged every red state governor, including my own, to do the same. Blue state governors ought to do the same if they don't want to keep businesses from leaving their state for other reasons as well. Well, you've been pretty steadfast in your criticism of Washington, D.C.'s out-of-control federal spending. And I want to get to President Biden's outrageous spending spree, it seems like to a lot of people, in just a moment. But is it fair to say Republicans have also strayed from being fiscally conservative? You know, when I decided to run back uh, after being a state legislator in Indiana, we believe in uh, balanced budgets, rainy day funds, um, I decided the problem that beset me and my company was federal in nature, uh, along with places like California, New York, New Jersey. That little business has now grown into, I think, 70 locations in 40 states. So clearly there's an issue. Spending is one component. What I hear mostly currently is competing with getting employees back to work. Mm -hmm. You cannot spend that much money, write it off with some new gimmick, modern monetary theory, and think that it's not going to come home to roost in inflation, difficulties in the midterm and long term. Mm -hmm. and, and let's talk about the current administration and their so-called infrastructure proposal. What are your thoughts on it? Well, don't be uh, beguiled by the Madison Avenue uh, phrases they put, like with the rescue plan, COVID relief bill. Well, less than 10% of it was that. They're doing a reprise with infrastructure. Everyone loves infrastructure. I believe at the federal government, uh, if we could afford it and do it sustainably next to defending the country and maybe shoring up entitlements, we ought to try to do a few things well. They beguile us again, call it the American Jobs Plan, 2.5 trillion, only 6% of it on roads and bridges, as most of us would understand infrastructure. Right, right. Is, is it hard for you to deal with lawmakers who don't have a real world understanding of business like you do? Is this part of the reason legislation like the Pro-Union Pro Act gets this far down the line? No doubt about it, because when I ran to, uh, the Constitution, which I think has been such a framework for liberty, enterprise, they never imagined that people would want to do this for a living mm -hmm. term after term. President Biden says he wants to get bipartisan support to move the country forward. Is that the feeling you're getting in Washington? No, that's again part of that kind of uh, sham of saying unity, let's discuss it. Let's look how that worked on the COVID relief plan. There was not one Republican vote for it. It took the biggest thing they are wrestling with now was another unforced error, extending unemployment benefits. We tried to get rid of that period, just like we did in the CARES Act in 2020, March, bringing it down from 600 to maybe three to 400. Not one Democrat went along with it. Now, now moving back to Indiana, how did COVID impact the jobs and people there? And now that we appear to be on the rebound, how's it impacting school kids in your state? You know, I think when you look how it's impacted people, it's been about the same across the country. It's been mostly about how intrusive government has gotten. We are in a state that has gotten more conservative over the last decade or two. Uh, there has been a spat between our state legislature that thought we were too much in the mandate category, one size fits all. And there's some a little bit of a wrestling match going on between our governor 
and the state legislature. That same dynamic, to some degree, played out in all 50 states. I think you look clearly at a place like Florida, just like I did uh, before we left uh, for the six weeks after we did the CARES Act. Treat it with respect. We don't know a lot about it. Do not do what government normally does. One size fits all. As Senator Ron, you were recently down on the nation's southern border. What did you see when you were there? That was an eye opener. Um, that was roughly a month ago. And I went down there because I think you need to see it firsthand. And I'll give you a, a couple of the more vivid moments. We get down there late on a Thursday, probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock. As we watched uh, mostly unaccompanied minors mm. and young women coming across the border that late at night, saw one of the first facilities that they came into, noticed the arrows on the ground pointing them where to go, had the uh, weird uh, encounter with the coyotes and smugglers when they were taunting uh, the border patrol. And I asked them what they said. They said, regardless of what you do, we're gonna keep coming. Next day, go up and down the river, uh, go to the Donna facility. Everything that they were railing against Trump on, they were doing themselves and an unforced error because it was at a 45 year low. I just asked uh, Secretary Mayorkas about that today and he didn't have good answers. He did tell us he's not gonna do the stay in Mexico policy, which the border patrol said that and the wall were the two things that by far made their job easier. Trump did it, they didn't like it, they're undoing it. What's worse, the humanitarian crisis or the national security crisis? So definitely there is a humanitarian crisis. What would force people to take a trek like that is hard to imagine. On the other hand, when you're using the logistics services of coyotes and smugglers, $4,000 an individual, not a family, 54 different nationalities came in in the Del Rio section that prior quarter. Mm. And can you imagine how many of them might have been in a category that would not be wholesome, let alone the ones that don't come across meeting the Border Patrol? It's a national security issue mixed with a big humanitarian concern. But in the short run, it was at least working. And now you've made it even a worse humanitarian concern because you're inviting people to come by the thousands, 150,000 in March, 174,000 in April, it's only gonna get worse. A very difficult situation. Our international relations with both friends and foes are critical. How do you think the Biden administration is handling itself? So when it comes to, let's take uh, in our region, I think number one, whenever your point of view is the opposite of your political opposition and only for the sake of that, that's not the basis of good policy. That's what's gonna dictate what's happening at the border. And by the way, that could be their Achilles heel. It was the biggest issue along with the high cost of healthcare and the economy when I ran in 18. Let's look at the broader scene. China is definitely our geopolitical foe. They play in the long game. They got much more endurance for pain in the short run. They've obviously become state capitalists because they know communism doesn't work. So could be two to three times the size of our economy, uh, at least equal to us in a decade and then moving away from us. They worry me and how we play the game with other part, uh, menaces out there like North Korea, Iran and Russia, not an economic threat, but one in a cybersecurity way. Uh, you know, you need to really be uh, wondering, will this policy of tough stance, but wanting to interchange ideas that Trump had, give way to something to where you give them uh, everything and we pay the consequences later? Well, we have a big announcement. The senator wants to unveil a secret, something that's hidden from most of us until it's too late and it could save you money on health care. We're going to talk about that when we come back.
Okay, I promised a big announcement that could save you a fortune in health care expenses. Here it is. The senator has a couple of proposals to make health care companies reveal all their hidden charges. Let's start with the first one. Senator, can you tell us about the Health Care Price Transparency Act? Yes, this is such a simple bill that, and it's embedded in a larger, larger presentation called the Fair Care Act, but health care transparency. And this is based upon what I actually did in my own business 2008. We had 300 employees then, tired of hearing how lucky I was. It's only going up 5 to 10 percent <laughs> a year. I was able to make a bold decision to engage my employees as health care customers. No one does that. And when the insurance companies told me that until you get them doing that, you're going to be always fighting rising costs. So I took simple principles. A lot of it lacks uh, availability in the healthcare industry, transparency, competition. There are barriers to entry, and the consumer has atrophied. They want either government or their employer to pay for their remediation when they enter the healthcare system. I got them to have skin in the game from dollar one and protected them from never going broke because they get sick or have a bad accident. I took the coinsurance variable off their shoulders. I asked them to help me keep costs down by shopping around like they would for groceries or a big screen TV. Could I didn't know if it was going to work. 13 years later, I asked my son the other day, how much of our health care costs gone up? We cut them by 50% back then. Oh. He said, Dad, you're not going to believe it. 10% over 13 years, less than a percent a year. Plus, they don't engage the health care system near as much as they did then because they're healthcare consumers. And they use the meager tools of transparency that are out there because we've trained them and incentivized them to do it. The healthcare, the Drug Price Transparency Act, which is a little more complicated because you have to know what a pharmacy benefit manager is. Can you explain? So what that is gonna do, pharma ironically is only 15% of the whole healthcare bill. Insurance is about the same. Uh, hospitals and practitioners, you know, kind of split the rest, but everybody probably has some prescription. PBMs, uh, the pharma industry does a great job on R&D and making the pill, but they have completely defaulted on distributing it and pricing it. That's where somebody had a harebrained idea. Let's create a new middleman. Where have you ever heard of that? <laughs> Adding more costs to distribution. Well, they did it. That now sucks 180 to $300 billion out of one of the smaller areas of healthcare, but that's still a lot of money. That could go completely. Whatever benefit you might need from a pharmacy benefit manager in terms of information, do that on a fee basis, take their markup out. Even pharma wants that. They've created a monster and it's all held together by even their unwillingness to be transparent on what drugs cost. Uh, so often they're dealing after the fact to fix something that's already ingrained in the system and that personifies, <clears throat> typifies healthcare in general. We'll leave it to a Hoosier to come up with a common sense approach to helping us get better health care. What are the chances of this passing? Who, who are we hoping to get behind this? Sadly, even though it makes so much sense, I've got a experiment that's been running successfully uh, in my own company. Uh, here's why. Chuck Schumer won't allow transparency on hardly anything because if you ask it of drug companies, you need it from hospitals, who are probably the biggest cost out there where there's no transparency. He gets campaign checks from the New York Hospital Association. Not just Chuck, almost everyone does. I don't think I'll get many going forward. Uh, I don't care about that anyway. That's why I ran and term limited myself not to do it more than two times because I can think independently. I want to switch subjects and ask you about the position you took to call out the double standard of big tech in the media. Amazon removed from its streaming service the critically acclaimed film Created Equal, a documentary about Justice Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas. <clears throat> it had a five-star rating. What does this tell you about cancel culture? This tells me that whether you want to approach it from their 
uh, censoring, censoring uh, activities are, whether they're just too large. Standard Oil got too large. Uh, telephones did, uh, and they had to do something about it. Big tech is arguably more significant than either one of them because they're selling and monitoring ideas. And Amazon might be in a category that's a little different. They at least compete in the retail sector, even though most of their money is made on the tech side of life. Facebook, Twitter, Google, all the rest of them, it's gotten too large. It'd be different if they weren't picking sides to boot. So I would uh, have a few cohorts on the conservative side of this place, along with, uh, ironically, many on the very liberal side, and the numbers are growing to where tech needs to be held responsible. And I'm not sure that it can be done by jawboning and uh, guidelining. It may have to be done the old-fashioned way, <clears throat> what had to work back in the Teddy Roosevelt days, and that's antitrust. And that is definitely on the table of discussion, even though it's a subject many don't like to go towards. As a true fiscal conservative, you sponsored the Maximizing America's Prosperity Act to create a roadmap to bring financial sanity back to Washington. What's the status of that bill now? So that's another one that uh, it makes perfect common sense. But since no one really wants to do it here, uh, including many in my own party, uh, it'll be mostly a messaging bill, sadly, just like a lot of the stuff I've tried to do on health care. Um, so much of what we do here, and I'll give you the example. When I got here uh, in 2019, sworn in, everybody was bragging about the criminal justice reform bill. Finally did it because we were running out of prison space. I said, by the way, how long have you been working on it? Eight, 10 to 11 or 12 years for that idea that's big in nature to get done. And I think a lot of people agree with you. Um, I respect the fact that you are unafraid to reach across the aisle. There's this fallacy that Republicans don't care about the environment, but you recently backed bipartisan legislation called the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Tell us about that. That's got an interesting story. So I get here sworn in January 19, been a conservationist my whole life, a steward of the land, and Chris, uh, Kuhn says, you know, I've tried every other Republican. You're new. You probably want to get your feet grounded. Uh, would you be interested in starting a Senate Climate Caucus? I said, well, sure I would. Well, the reason it wasn't hard for me to do it is I've been an entrepreneur where you can't stammer, drag your feet if you want to seize a moment or something that you already believe in. He said, well, good, but this is a caucus. Can you get any other Republican? It only took me a month and a half, and I got six others. And when I said, we're going to do this, not from the point of view of the Green New Deal, uh, I don't like that. That won't work. We can't pay for it. How can we find common ground on stuff that's not going to take another federal outlay or at least something that we can't offset it? He said, hey, I'm willing to try anything. That has got now nearly 50 senators, more Republicans and Democrats, on a simple idea for farmers, both tree and ag, match the small ones up with pre-existing private markets. They can't do it currently. And great idea. Uh, that to me was a place where you could find commonality. Could be one of the first bills that gets across the floor this year successfully and on an issue that was taboo climate. Republicans, conservatives have got to be uh, better than the party of no, or I don't want to talk about it, keeping our principles intact. We've probably not engaged enough in the past, end up going along with the other side because we want a lot on defense. They want domestic spending. Uh, they have no budget ability. All of that's kind of the unholy alliance. Maybe this starts a new dynamic of where you're practical, do things that you can agree on that don't bring out the worst of us and things that didn't work in the past. I think so many of us agree with you, Senator, and thanks so much for taking time to share your positions and talk with me today, and thank you for all you're doing. That wraps up our show for now. Thanks for watching, and hope you'll join me for my next conversation. So long.
Hey, I'm Rob Finnerty. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe too. Hit the bell icon to be alerted to breaking news. And remember, there's a whole lot more on Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news network. Newsmax TV, where real news for real people.